Open up your Bible to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to be taking one more week uh, before we jump back into Romans. Uh, So next week, Smed will be taking us back into Romans, continuing uh, to lead us through that. Uh, This week, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 3. We've been going in our 414 ministry here at Grace Bible Church, which is the young adults ministry at Grace Bible Church. So post high school through 20s, uh, we have a ministry. We've been working through uh, wisdom, And what does God have to say about wisdom and various topics? And there's a passage that uh, we've been coming back to over and over again in our study as we've considered wisdom and various avenues of life. And it's what we're going to look at in chapter 3. And we're just going to kind of dive into this passage this morning and hopefully benefit from God's word in regards to what he has to say about us pursuing him above all else, about us relying upon him above on all else. It, it was one of the most pivotal Christmas days in all of American history. Uh, during uh, the War of Independence, the British used many different kinds of mercenaries, uh, hired soldiers to fight for them. And since they couldn't send all of their soldiers across the sea, they would hire different soldiers to fight their battles for them. And there was a renowned mercenary by the name of Johann Rahl. Rawl hated Americans. He detested the British rebels that were calling themselves Americans. He was a professional soldier trained to the highest degree. His opposers were just farmers, craftsmen with no training, and Rawl developed a reputation over the years as a ruthless commander who just disrespected the reputation of the Americans at every turn. He thought they were weak cowards who could not possibly stand against him and his highly trained forces. Well, he was in command of the British city of Trenton on Christmas of 1776. And a little background here. On Christmas Eve, the junior officers began informing him that there was a looming attack from the Americans on Trenton, that they wanted to capture the city. The Americans had been beaten back very badly. The war was literally hanging in the balance. It was the dead of winter, and the American forces were literally freezing to death. They were trying one last time to secure a victory at Trenton. It was a fortified outpost of the British Empire, very unlikely to be attacked. When Rawl heard about these plans, he laughed and refused to add more soldiers. In haughty pride, he said bayonets would be enough for these simple men. And after receiving this news, he then threw a drunken party, played cards all night, abandoning the warnings brought to his attention and slept in on Christmas Day. It was a bitterly cold night on that Christmas Eve. Uh, Americans who were crossing the river thought the pieces of ice floating down the Delaware were going to hit their boats and sink them. And yet, Rawl was so distracted by his drinking that he never read a letter given to him by an officer who was a spy with the Americans that said they're going to attack tomorrow. Furthermore, The second in command had given the troops off Christmas morning because it was Christmas and it was very cold. And so they were inside warming their hands and their feet. You probably know the story. You've probably seen paintings of Washington crossing the Delaware. The Americans totally surprised Rawl and his forces. Rawl ordered a counterattack, mounted his horse, and as soon as he did, he was shot. And as he laid in the street bleeding to death, George Washington stood over him and had him sign a surrender. He only lived long enough to make that signature, and then he died. Rawl, in his prideful arrogance, thought he knew best. Rawl, in his prideful arrogance, thought he was incapable of defeat by such little forces. He was ill-prepared and ignored wise counsel, brushed aside warnings because of this, Because of all of this, literally, a nation was brought into being, and the British lost the American colonies. It cannot be overstated. It cannot be overstated the danger of our own prideful arrogance. The danger of self-will. The danger of self-desire, of self-reliance. For all, 
he in his confidence thought he could navigate his forces to victory in his own wisdom, his own assessment of things, his own strength. And the warning for us is that we would try to navigate this life in our pride, that we would try to navigate the various circumstances that we face in life, that we would try to conduct ourselves in an appropriate manner in the midst of those circumstances independently, with our own resources, in our own wisdom, ignoring the resources that God has placed right before us. So thinking on these things, consider with me Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to kind of dive in and look at verses five through eight this morning. Proverbs three, starting in verse five. Solomon says, trust in Yahweh or trust in the Lord, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. We must abandon self-reliance. And we must completely depend and rely upon God. If we're to navigate this life to the glory of God as ones who have been saved by Christ, by the work of Christ, as ones who have placed their faith in the gospel, if we're to navigate this life as that kind of person living now for the glory of God. We must cultivate total reliance upon God. We must seek to live by God's means in God's resources for God's glory. And in verses five through eight, there are two primary commands for cultivating total reliance upon the Lord. In verses five through eight, there are two primary commands for cultivating total reliance upon the Lord. Solomon uses poetic parallelism where we see multiple statements of instruction getting at the same idea or the same instruction. And this breaks down into two sections, verses five and six and verses seven and eight. And what each section is doing is it's communicating one primary instruction that we are to heed, that we are to obey, that we are to follow. And what the culmination of obedience to this instruction in these four verses produces is total, total reliance upon Yahweh, upon the Lord God. Solomon is giving instruction that when heeded leads one to trust God in life's various circumstances, trials, and victories, and to conduct themselves within those circumstances in a God-honoring way. Solomon in chapter 3 has been following a pattern every two verses giving rapid-fire instruction for his sons. And some have thought verses 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 go together, that that those are are one primary instruction repeated the same way. And while they're very similar, there is nuanced elements to both of them. And the pattern of chapter 3 shows that Solomon is giving new instruction each couple of verses for his sons to heed. And so while what we're going to see, the instruction in verse 5 and 6 and the instruction in verses 7 and 8, they overlap, they also have a nuanced difference, and we'll draw that out as we look at them together this morning. So number one, the first command for cultivating total reliance upon the Lord is this, trust Yahweh or trust the Lord in your circumstances. Trust the Lord in your circumstances. Look at verses five and six again. It's right there. Trust in the Lord. That's the primary thrust of these verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then the negative. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And then following the command, the consequence, the result, and he will make your paths straight. Solomon breaks down this command, summarizing it it really in three different ways, all communicating the same idea or the same truth from different directions. In the last part of the verse, verse 6, he gives us the outcome or the consequence of obedience to this command. And we're in Proverbs, so these are general principles that when followed generally lead to these outcomes. 
Wherever you find yourself in life, whether it's the physical circumstances around you or happening to you or just in your thinking, in your mind, you must, we must trust God. That's the call here, to trust God. Here Solomon is, is really communicating the idea of trusting God. And, and especially in seasons of, of trial or, or difficulty, in seasons of life where, where you can't see the outcome. When the lines that connect the dots of your life aren't clear, are you trusting God? Now let's break down Solomon's instruction line by line here, and then we're going to circle back around and and kind of revisit everything together, put it all together. But first, look at verse 5. Trust in Yahweh, or trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust. To trust in. This is to put confidence in. To put dependence upon, to trust. And the object of your trust is God himself. And as we've discussed before, it is trust in the Lord, all caps. And when you see Lord, capital L-O-R-D, and it's all caps, we, we know that in the Hebrew, it is the personal name for God, Yahweh. This is to put your trust in Yahweh. You are to trust in Yahweh God in life's various circumstances. There is to be a continual entrustment of yourself to God. We should at all times have our hearts anchored to God in trust. And this trust here is comprehensive. The command is to trust in Yahweh with your whole heart, with the entirety of yourself. In your inner man, trust God. From your mission control center, trust God. No part of you holding on to your your feelings or your reasoning. Trust God wholly. There is to be nothing in you resisting your entrustment to God. Nothing you are clinging on to. You are to have an unreserved trusting in God, not relying on anything else. This is the positive side of the command. And then we see the second line of parallelism here in a a negative command. This isn't a new idea, but a reiteration of the same principle from another direction. You see that there. Do not lean on your own understanding. The second half of verse 5. Do not lean on your own understanding. You need divine understanding. Trust in God with all yourself. And to support this principle, Do not do or don't do the opposite of this, which is trusting in your own understanding. Sometimes opposites are difficult. I I think I saw a discussion recently on Facebook as to what the opposite of ice cream was. (laughs) It was really interesting. I thought at first glance it would be easy, but there were comments including things from pizza to soup to warm milk. I don't know that there was a a conclusive decision. Sometimes it's hard to know what the opposite of things are. Here in this example, it's easy. We see the opposite clear before us. The opposite of, of trusting in God with all your heart is leaning upon, depending upon your own understanding. Do not trust yourself. Which demonstrates that from God's perspective, which ultimately is the only one that matters, if you are not trusting in God, you are leaning on your own understanding. You are trusting in yourself. The instruction to not lean on your own understanding is is literally don't brace yourself within life's various circumstances upon, upon your Assessment of situations, your understanding of things. Don't steady yourself with how what is going on in your life and how that fits in with your understanding. You need divine understanding. We all do. Don't don't stay your heart. Don't allow yourself to be directed by your assessment of the circumstances. I want this outcome. This is going this way. Therefore, I conclude this is good. Or, I want this outcome, this is going this way, therefore I conclude this is bad. And I need to manipulate things and and get in the middle of this to control the outcome that I want in my own reasoning and my own desires and my own perspective. No, don't stay our hearts upon what we desire, our assessment of circumstances. We are to trust the Lord with all of ourselves. 
not God and my understanding. Uh, consider Jeremiah 17.5. You can just listen for a moment. Jeremiah 17.5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Jeremiah 17.5. Don't allow your heart to turn away from the Lord trusting in yourself. Don't make flesh your strength when God desires to be your strength. God desires to sustain you. God desires to lead you, to support you. Don't listen to yourself. Don't trust your assessment of things apart from God's word. Don't support yourself. Don't lean on your own understanding. To make sense of things. Don't do any of this. Rather, again, Solomon in verse 6 brings more light to this command. Look down at verse 6. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge or know him. We are to always, in every one of our ways, take the Lord into account. Acknowledge him. It's to know him. Each step we are to take, we are to take, making sure that in each step, we recognize God's presence and are seeking God's direction. We are called to understand God's nearness in every moment. And how much good would would consistent practice of this have upon our lives? If in every moment, and if every step, if in every misstep, if in every challenge, every offense we feel, every disappointment we experience, every unmet expectation we have, we recognize and acknowledge him He is there. He is near. He is good. He is loving. He is faithful. He's working out his righteous providence in every moment, and he is trustworthy. And as you address life and all of its challenges, all of the various circumstances you find yourself in, we don't, we mustn't lean on our intellect to work things out. We need to acknowledge God and go to God for direction, to trust him, trust in his word. And then what's the result of this? What is the consequence of obedience to this, that we would trust God in all of our circumstances? It says it there. The second half of verse six. And he will make your paths straight. For your path to be straight is to receive direction from God. God is the one who gives a straight path. This is a a shepherding imagery here. This expresses God's care for those who are his and demonstrates that God is kind and loving and generous and merciful to his people. This command to trust in God, the prohibition to not lean on your own understanding, it's for our good. It's an expression of God's kindness and care for us. It's, It's for our benefit. This is going to help you. For God to make your path straight means more than guidance. It it means God removes the obstacles, making a smooth path or, or way of life. God brings one to the appointed goal of life. And what a glorious promise. We don't have to carry the burden of figuring out our own path, of figuring out what the right path is independently. We don't have to manipulate our circumstances to get the outcome we desire. And that we think is best. No, we, we trust God. We recognize his presence. And when we humble ourselves under God's care and direction, we can actually have confidence that we are on God's intended path for you. For us. Have you ever felt in a season of perpetual disappointment? I really want this thing and it's just not happening. If only God would do this thing. If only my circumstance would change in this way. Listen, what God asks of us is not to get our hands on those things and and make them move forward how we desire. No. Trust in him. 
And if you are trusting him, if you are not leaning on your own understanding, if you are acknowledging him in all of your ways, you can have confidence that though there may be this thing that you desire in your life, you are on a straight path. One that is pleasing to the Lord and one that is good for you. Now, Let's loop back around and and put all this together a little bit more here. This passage sets up a standoff for who you're going to trust. Are you going to trust in yourself or are you going to place your trust in God? In all of life's circumstances, when all of life's victories and in all of life's challenges and hardships and trials, who will you put your trust in as you navigate these things? Who will you trust? God? God? The promises of God, the purposes of God, the word of God, or your reasoning, or your experiences, or your emotions, your perspective and your understanding. This can be painfully difficult, painfully difficult. It's so easy to hear our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own desires so much louder than we ought. And to hear God's instruction from his word to set our minds on truth from scripture far less than we should. What does this look like practically? To to trust God is to invite God's perspective into every area of our lives. To trust in the Lord, we must know the Lord. To trust the promises of God in life's hardships, in unexpected difficult seasons, we must know the promises of God. And yet simply knowing truth is not enough. You actually have to trust in them. You have to believe. You must have faith in God with your heart, with all of yourself. You must look away from yourself in life's various circumstances and look to truth, to God. And as you seek to trust God, your great aid and expression of this is to look to Scripture, to look what God has revealed. And so when life's trials come, who will you trust? Who must we trust? The promises of God The word of God, or again, our understanding, our experiences, our emotions, our perspectives. Will you concern yourself more with getting your desired outcome or embracing God's desired character for your life? When you're tempted to put your foot down and reject trusting in God, go to the promises of God, go to the instruction of God. Speak truth to yourself that God's way is best, that God is near, that God is sovereign and wise. This is really heart shepherding. This is what we talk about so frequently, directing your heart how to think and how to respond to life's circumstances, not allowing your heart to take the reins of your life, to dictate your response. And when you do this, when you trust the Lord, he will make your path straight and you will know you are on God's path for your life. But when you trust in your own authority, you have no confidence at all that you are on God's path. In fact, it's the opposite. And we must trust God. And again, we must do this with our whole heart. And this can be difficult. Sometimes we're, we're more willing to trust God with our lives, except for maybe this one area. Oh yes, we need to trust God in all areas of life. And then someone brings up a certain area and you go, oh, uh, this one's a little harder to let go of. I'll give you this area, but this other one is untouchable. I've been hurt. I've been betrayed. I've been let down. I tried trusting you in this area before and it didn't feel good. I don't want to do that again. I'll trust you in these things, but this area over here, it's off limits. Mm -mm. Listen, we, we can't do that. We can't draw lines on our life of where we will trust God and where we are unwilling to trust. No, we must fully entrust ourselves to God. We deny ourselves. We trust God. 
This is faith. And Solomon is writing this as instruction for his sons. And Solomon isn't giving his sons this instruction because they need it when everything is going great. This isn't the kind of instruction that you need when everything is going great and feels wonderful. This kind of instruction is for when our faith is being tested. This instruction is to resonate in our hearts and minds when it's difficult. And we all have those times. We all experience various trials, difficulties. You might be in one now. And you're struggling. Maybe, maybe no one even knows except you and God. And you've been trust understanding. You've been living in discontentment and lack of trust. And you're in despair. And you don't understand why you're experiencing what you're experiencing now. You don't understand God's reasoning. You don't understand why you're being treated a specific way. You don't, under, you don't understand why God would allow you to be going through what is before you. Listen, you're, you're not alone in your struggles. We all have things that come into our life, various difficulties and various seasons where our faith gets put to the test. And in these moments, notice what he says in verse six. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Even in your despair, acknowledge him, know him. In your highest highs and in your lowest lows, acknowledge him. And as you experience those times of trials, let prayer and dependence upon God be a guide for you as you acknowledge God's presence. Go to him, God, I don't understand. I don't understand. And in fact, I don't need to understand. In my own wisdom, I, I might lean on that. If I understood why this is happening apart from you, I might actually be tris, tr uh, tempted to trust in that. So God, I, what I need is not more information about my circumstances. What I need is greater faith in you. Would you give that to me? And you trust God. You entrust yourself to him. Not leaning on your own understanding, you, you say, God, I will place my faith in you. I trust you, God, when I can't see beyond the moment. I will trust you. In those moments, there's only two choices. Either you're going to trust in God, or you're going to trust in your own understanding. When your emotions or experiences are, are guiding your life more than scripture, you are not living under God's authority. You are not entrusting yourself to God's wisdom. We cannot, we cannot be driven by our own understanding and at the same time say we are trusting God. We cannot depend upon our reasoning. Solomon is saying, boys, don't look to yourself in life's various circumstances. And so with us, we must not look to ourselves. In fact, what does it reveal about me when I am leaning on my own understanding, on my own opinions? I have officially trusted in myself. I've put my hope in myself. I've become my own idol. And that never leads to a straight path. And yet for those who trust God, he says he will make our path straight. Where you are holding on to your own understanding, we must let go. Is there anything in your life that you've made untouchable? Where you've said, I, I know scripture may say this, but God's going to have to do something miraculous in order for me to submit to him here. Well, listen, repent. Repent. Let God do something miraculous and don't lean on your own understanding. We want to produce whatever we can to make us feel more comfortable and to manipulate the outcome. Oftentimes, oftentimes we even disguise this with good intentions. Just think for a moment the contrast between Peter as Jesus was about to go to the cross and Jesus' perspective as he was being beaten uh, Peter did this with Jesus here, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. 
You can just listen for a moment. Matthew 16, 21 through 23 says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter, in all of his own wisdom, took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, rebuking Jesus is just never a good idea. If your wisdom leads you to think, oh man, I think Jesus is missing something here. I really need to help him out. Good thing he has a friend like me. Maybe just rethink that a little bit. He took him aside, began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But then he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. We must never set our hearts on man's interests. We must humbly come before God's word and set our hearts and our minds on God's interests. But then listen, Peter, Peter dropped the ball there, but listen to this. In 1 Peter 2, he brings great insight and instruction. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23 He says, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. We don't have to play judge. We have to trust. And what's interesting here is that Jesus' trust in God didn't lead to easy, comfortable circumstances at every moment. And yet there was not a moment when he was not on the straight path. We need to trust God's providence, trust God's sovereignty, trust his goodness, trust his wisdom. And in the midst of the various trials and struggles, we need to entrust ourselves to God. Even though we only see in the moment, God sees far beyond. And actually in his sovereign will is bringing all things to pass for his glory and for his people's good. We don't have to play judge. Our understanding is limited by our interests and it is tainted by our sin, yet God sees beyond the moment and is working things according to his good and sovereign will. And you might say, but if I do this, how do I know that everything's gonna turn out okay? I've been burned before. I've trusted God and it ended in misery. How did you come to the conclusion that that wasn't good? If Jesus abandoned God's will for his life, abandoned trusting God when he was nailed to the cross, none of us would be here. In life's hardest moments, deepest sorrows, most severe hurts, though we may mean it for evil, God in his providence is working out all things in accordance to his will for his glory. And God's ultimate glory is far more important than our immediate comfort. So if we feel, how can I trust God and know it will turn out okay? We probably need to bring our hearts to God's word and rethink what we mean by turns out okay. Number one, the first command for cultivating total reliance upon the Lord is that we need to trust Yahweh in your circumstances. Number two, the second command for cultivating total reliance upon God, total reliance upon the Lord is this, fear the Lord in your conduct. We are to trust the Lord in our circumstances and we are to fear the Lord in our conduct. Look at verses seven and eight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Here Solomon gives another instruction expressed similarly. 
He comes at this command from a couple different directions, communicating the same reality. And this instruction to fear the Lord or fear Yahweh is very similar to the prior one to trust God. However, the nuanced difference is that the trust of God in our circumstances demonstrates a looking to God and an entrustment in the character of God as we navigate the various circumstances we find ourselves in. But here, the call to fear Yahweh, the statement following fear the Lord, where Solomon says, and turn away from evil, indicates that the focus in this section is a humble submission to God in life that leads leads to not conducting yourself independent from him, but rather conducting ourselves in a manner of humility that fears God and flees evil. So where the first two verses indicated an entrustment of ourselves in God's various circumstances, these two verses indicate a fear of God, a humble submission to God and his standards and his desires for our conduct as we navigate circumstances. Again, very similar with some nuanced emphasis, and hopefully that'll draw out more as we work through here. Let's break this down line by line like we did the previous verses, and then we'll circle back again. Look at verse seven. Do not be wise in your own eyes. The reason we need this instruction is because we are naturally prone to think we are wise in our own eyes. You don't remind your children to brush their teeth before bed every night because their natural inclination is to brush their teeth before bed every night. No, you remind them because they don't remember. So it is here. Our natural inclination is to be wise in our own eyes. And Solomon here gives the very explicit instruction to not think that way, to not have that kind of self-assessment. The command to not be wise in your own eyes is because it is the natural inclination of the fallen human heart to think they have it together, to think we see things clearly. And here Solomon says, do not be wise. What is wisdom? Wisdom. What is it to be wise? Wisdom is the the wise application of biblical truths in your various circumstances. Uh, Biblical wisdom is understanding God's standard, understanding God's expectations and desires or instructions, and then functioning under that appropriately. Biblical wisdom is understanding God's standard, expectations and desires or instructions, and then functioning under that appropriately. And the command here is, is don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't think you independently, separate from God, can navigate the circumstances in life with conduct that is right or good or pleasing to the Lord. To be wise in your own eyes is to think, I can handle my sin. I can handle temptations in my own strength, through my own means, my own ways. Now, in these verses, you have a a negative and a positive command. Do not be wise from your own perspective, and then positively, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And again, we see the same truth being communicated by coming at the same reality from different directions. The positive instruction in the second half of verse 7 is the opposite of being wise in your own eyes. Look down again at verse 7. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. One who is not wise in their own eyes is one who actually fears the Lord and turns away from evil. This is a call that we are to all follow. There's no room for the believer to have a self-assessment that esteems themselves as having the answers, independent from God, independent from God's word. Turn to the right just a little bit to Proverbs 26, 12. Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? 
there is more hope for a fool than for him. More hope for a fool than for the one who thinks they are wise in their own eyes. You can turn back to Proverbs 3. Because of our sinful self, we look upon ourselves more highly than we ought. We need to think rightly about the reality that we are utterly desperate when left to ourselves to navigate our lives in a manner that is pleasing to God. In fact, if we think we are wise in our own eyes, we're worse than a fool. The deception of self-confidence is great. Our problem oftentimes is we think too much and too highly of ourselves and we don't think highly enough or often enough of God and what he has to say. Solomon instructs his sons here to fear God. Fear fear of God comes with a right view of God's holiness and a a right view of yourself. When we see ourselves rightly and, and our sinfulness clearly, it should cause a reverential fear that leads us to have far less confidence in our assessments and evaluations of what is right and good and much quicker to submit ourselves to what God has said is righteous and what is good. Do not be wise in your own eyes and fear God. This is a very prevalent theme that characterizes the book of Proverbs as well as scripture as a whole and and that's that wisdom is related to fear. Wisdom is related to fear, but the fear of the Lord. And I know it is common to want to talk about how God is love and God is gracious and God is merciful and God is kind and all those things are true. We should talk about those things. But we should also talk about the reality that God is terrifying. God is holy. God is righteous. We're commanded to fear him. There's to be a reverential fear and awe at the glory and weightiness, the holiness, the uniqueness, the set-apartness of God, his greatness. He's the only one who can cast your body and soul into hell. There's to be a reverential fear of God. Just listen for a moment to what scripture has to say about this in a few different places. Job twenty-eight, twenty-eight, And to man he said, Behold, the fear of Yahweh, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. That's Job 28, 28. Psalm 1, 11, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom and before honor comes humility. That's what biblical wisdom is about. It begins with the fear of the Lord. As we fear God, we are eager to please him and concerned about offending him and violating his word, his standard. And so you tremble at the word of God when you think about going outside of it. You say, I want to walk carefully. I want to walk intentionally. I want to honor you. I want to please you. Turn for a moment to Isaiah. Isaiah ch- chapter 66. You can keep your hand in Proverbs 3. Isaiah 66, starting in verse 1. Thus says Yahweh, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares Yahweh. Majestic, mighty, powerful. And then look at the second half of verse two. But to this one, I will look. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble 
and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. The greatness of God is put on display in those verses. And yet, what catches God's gaze? What catches his, his attention? What, is, what does he look to? What does he see? One who is humble, contrite of spirit, and who trembles before God's word. Is that you? Do you fear God appropriately? The contrast between the one who thinks they have it together in their own strength, by their own reasoning, in their own assessment, versus the one who fears God is dramatic. Who is humble and contrite before God? Who is the one that trembles at his word? It must be us. And it's not one who who thinks they have it together, who thinks they don't need God's word, or thinks that God's word needs to submit itself to your assessment and your circumstances and your perspective and your experiences. Fear God. This is the prerequisite for wisdom. Because you'll never want to live as you should if you do not understand how utterly terrifying the reality of God's holiness and glory and standard of righteousness is. And so we live seeking to please him and love him. And how sweet is it that as followers of Jesus Christ, we do this because we love him. It is a holy reverential fear of love, not of appeasement. Oh, What a weight, what a burden to be under our sin, trying to do good to appease his standard. We can never do that. But Jesus did. Jesus did. Jesus satisfied God's righteous standard perfectly and then went to the cross and took on himself the sin that we deserved The punishment that we deserved, if you are a follower of Jesus, was placed upon him so that we don't have to bear that anymore, so that we are no longer under condemnation. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we no longer fear the Lord. His dying on the cross did relieve us from the condemnation of our sin, but not from the obligation to fear God. We fear him, but we do it out of a reverential love. And so we pursue holiness and we pursue obedience and we entrust ourselves to God and we cling to his word because we love him. Because it's what's right. And our hope in our imperfection, in our doing this not perfectly yet, is that God has forgiven our sins and our trespasses. That's why fearing God, loving God, the love of God, the holiness of God, these things don't contradict, they complement in God's perfect wisdom. Well, Solomon doesn't leave it at fearing God only, but gives greater clarity as to the manifestation of one fearing God as he says, turn away from evil. Turn from evil. To turn away from evil, this is to avoid it. This is to see evil and go the other way. You don't say, how close can I get to evil? You go the opposite way of what is evil. And then what is the result of this? Look at verse 8. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Literally, there will be healing or health. The Hebrew word is to your navel or your umbilical cord. The refreshment or strengthening to your bones. Oftentimes in Hebrew, we see anthropological terms dealing with man or parts of man, and they typically should be taken holistically. And here Solomon is referring to a healing to every dimension. Here Solomon is is not talking simply about the physical healing and he's not talking figuratively only about spiritual healing. Rather, these statements encompass the entirety of the person. These things are connected. 
And again, this is proverbial wisdom that the general outcome is you will have healing to the center core of what brings nourishment to you and, and strengthening to your bones. It is, it is just always better for us to walk, for us to live in submission to God and his instruction, to be humble before him. It is always for our good to do this, to entrust ourselves to him. Now, let's circle back around on this. Uh, like a child spreading Lego pieces on a table, able to, to see the various pieces before them. Solomon, in these verses, really spreads our heart out on the table here in a way that brings much clarity. What, what does it mean to not be wise in my own eyes? It means you look to the word of God for your instruction. You don't trust your own heart or even your own assessments. And it's so easy to go through life with a, a great confidence in ourself and a deep suspicion towards everyone else. And it should be the opposite. We need to consult God's word and God's means of care for us. And listen, the body of Christ is a great aid. God has said so in his word for our lives, for our godliness, for our conduct. The body of Christ is a great means of God care, God's care for us. The body of Christ is a, a great aid for us to be on guard from trusting in our own wisdom, even around the word of God. We must be connected to one another in each other's lives, caring for one another. And so we, we do not trust in ourselves, but we turn away from evil. We run from evil. This means we take every occasion and every means of grace that God has placed in our lives to aid us in our pursuit of holiness. We run away from evil. We're eager to please God and we're concerned about offending God. And so we consult his word on everything we can in our lives. And we live recognizing God's presence in every moment, in all things, we don't trust our battle against sin to ourselves, but we realize we need the resources that God generously gives to us. We cannot let our emotions come against the word and then trump the word as the authority. We can't be like raw with a complete disregard for the warnings or a complete uh, underestimation of the dangers before us. We must submit ourselves to God and recognize him as the ultimate authority. And you might say, Josh, this seems really extreme. Is it really a big deal to not trust God? Do we really need to seek God's word in all of life's choices and all of our conduct? Is it, is it really that important? Well, where else would we go? Where else would we go than to the word of God? If you are one who does not look at God's word in your life decisions or rejects God's instruction in your life, you are one who is wise in their own eyes. If you have set up barriers of when and how you will let God's word be brought to your life, you are one who is wise in their own eyes. Work, church, Relationships, hobbies, battles for holiness, gray areas, life decisions, challenging relationships, liberties. We cannot approach proper conduct in any of these things depending on our own strength without consulting God's word. What about those decisions that aren't clear in Scripture? So we need to think carefully about every choice in our life that could lead to sin and temptation. Why would we want to try and figure out how little we can go to God's word and use God's resources? Well, we should think about it differently. We should, we should turn away from sin. We should fear God. We should mine the wealth of riches in God's word. He's given us all things pertaining in life and to life and godliness. And so to think that there's something in my life that God just hasn't spoken to is self-deception. He has spoken to all things that we need to hear to be able to conduct ourselves in a manner that is pleasing to him, ready for every good deed that he would have for us. We must not play on the fringe of the culture or play on the fringe of sin 
Where the Bible is clear, we must pursue what is best. Otherwise, we might find ourselves one day so far down the road in our own liberties, in our own entrustment of ourselves to our understanding where our heart is hardened and we're neck deep in sin. Usually, uh, the atrocious sins we hear of people getting in or we find ourselves in, uh, we don't get there overnight. It's little compromises. Trusting ourselves a little bit here and then a little more and then a little more. Little areas of negligence and they harden our hearts. They give us a false trust in ourselves or a false, and a false or wrong suspicion of God. We must fear God. Seek to please him. God is supremely trustworthy. We have the benefit this side of the cross, cross of seeing so clearly God's trustworthiness and God's extreme provision in his son. How could we ever, when thinking rightly about the gospel, come to the conclusion that God is not trustworthy? That our way would be best. How could we doubt his faithfulness when we sit at the foot of the cross? God has only ever been faithful at great cost to himself. We can trust him. Do you trust him? More importantly, have you entrusted yourself to him? Holy. Have you turned away from a life of perpetually living for yourself, of perpetually living in your own authority? And have you humbled yourself before God in faith and repentance, looking to who he is and what he has done through his son and his death on the cross? Have you recognized that you're a sinner, that you could never meet God's standard, that you deserve judgment and wrath and punishment? You are guilty before him, and the only remedy is Jesus. It has to start there for each one of us. And then as we experience the riches of knowing God, of no longer being under his condemnation, of having fellowship with him, we walk day by day trusting in him, not leaning on our own understanding, fearing him. And whatever life circumstances bring, we entrust ourselves to him. And as we seek to navigate those circumstances, we fear him recognizing his presence always. He will never disappoint you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your care, for your amazing love. We thank you that you long for us to be near to you, to entrust ourselves to you, Lord, I pray that we would be men and women who do not look to ourselves. In all of life's circumstances, in all of our interactions, I pray that we would not place our hope, not place our confidence in us, but that your word would ever be before us. That we would trust in you and, and you alone, that you would be what you are, which is a rock for us. And that in you, we would find hope and peace and joy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together.